Hi everyone! In this video we're going to review molecular orbital theory very briefly and then we're going to apply it to our conjugated pi systems that we talked about last time. All right, so down below we have the molecular orbital diagram for a hydrogen molecule. Now let's start with just a single hydrogen atom. We know that it has one valence electron and we can draw that in um, an atomic orbital. So we show the one electron as an arrow and let's say we have another hydrogen atom. Well, hydrogen atoms on their own are pretty unstable. So they would prefer to be paired up with something. So let's say these two hydrogen atoms <clears throat> pair up with each other. Now, if they pair up with each other, they form a covalent bond. And that's represented by a bonding molecular orbital. So once you apply orbitals to a molecule, things can get a little more complex. Um, so that's why we're looking at a simple molecule here. But you do end up with more stable bonding molecular orbitals and more unstable antibonding molecular orbitals. So the two electrons that we have from each hydrogen, they're going to go into that more stable molecular orbital, the bonding orbital first. And then if we have any other electrons, they'll go into the antibonding molecular orbital, the more unstable orbital. So remember that the bonding molecular orbital is given the symbol sigma and the antibonding molecular orbital is given the symbol sigma star. So let's apply this to our conjugated pi systems. So let's start with that molecule 1,3-butadiene that we were talking about last time. Um, we have two double bonds and they're separated by a single bond. So that's a conjugated system. But additionally, notice that each carbon atom um, is sp2 hybridized. So that means that each carbon has a p orbital. Oh, <laughs> I forgot to draw the last carbon atom. We've got our four p orbitals. And notice that we have four pi electrons. So we need to figure out where those four pi electrons are going to go. Now similar to our hydrogen example, we have two bonding molecular orbitals. So those are the two lower energy orbitals. And then we have two antibonding molecular orbitals. So those are higher in energy. So again, notice that all four pi electrons are in the bonding molecular orbitals. Now those bonding molecular orbitals um, we have two situations there. The lower energy molecular orbital um, has all of its p orbitals aligned. So notice that these p orbitals have um, two lobes and the lobes are slightly different from each other. So we label them as blue and red just to show that they're a little bit different. And if all of the blue lobes are aligned and all of the red lobes are aligned, then the pi electrons will be completely delocalized across the entire molecule. So that's kind of like um, one of our 
hybrid resonance structures, right? And remember, resonance is what stabilizes a molecule. So this is our most stable scenario where all four p orbitals are aligned. All right, now our second bonding orbital is a little bit different. So we still have p orbitals that are aligned with each other, the left two and the right two, but the left two orbitals are flipped from the right two orbitals. So we create this area in the middle where pi electrons can't exist. And so this is called a node. So in this situation, we would have our two pi bonds, but they would not delocalize. So the electrons would be localized in those specific positions. So that's a little less stable for the molecule. But it's still stable enough that it is a bonding orbital. Now, if we go up to the antibonding molecular orbitals, you'll notice that um, we're creating more nodes or areas where electrons can't exist. So in the third molecular orbital, the two central p orbitals are aligned, but the outer orbitals are not aligned. So that's a little more unstable. And then at the very top, we have our least stable situation where none of the orbitals are aligned with each other. So electrons cannot delocalize at all. Now that we kind of have gone over these different uh, molecular orbitals, let's learn a couple of new terms here. The highest energy orbital that contains electrons is called the highest occupied molecular orbital. And it's given the acronym HOMO. And then the uh, next highest orbital is the first orbital that doesn't have any electrons. So we call that the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So that's called LUMO. Now these two orbitals are probably the most important orbitals because this is where all the chemistry happens. So for instance, let's say we decided to react 1,3-butadiene with another molecule. Well, that other molecule might donate an electron to 1,3-butadiene. And that electron would have to go into the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. Or, maybe 1,3-butadiene gives up an electron. Well, it would have to give up an electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital. Or maybe 1,3-butadiene is reacting on its own. So it can absorb energy and excite one of its electrons into the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So again, this is where all of the chemistry happens, is between what we call the LUMO and the HOMO levels here. Now, um, the energy difference between those two levels is also really important, because if an electron is excited up to the LUMO, um, it's going to be easier to do that if that energy difference is really small. So um, these two orbitals, the LUMO and the HOMO, they're called the frontier orbitals because that's where all the chemistry happens. And later on, we'll talk about photochemical reactions that are induced by light. And again, that's going to happen between the LUMO and the HOMO. All right, so let's look at a slightly more complex molecule, but still with a conjugated pi system. 
So we're going to look at 135 hexatriene. So here we have three double bonds, which means we have six pi electrons. And that also means that we have six p orbitals. Now, again, we have a lot of different um, ways that those p orbitals could align or not align with each other. So in our first um, or lowest energy situation, all six of the p orbitals are aligned. So the pi electrons can delocalize across the entire molecule. And that's very stable because that provides um, kind of that resonance we were talking about. So all of the bonds have partial pi character and that really stabilizes it. Now, if we go up a level, we have a situation where the three pi or uh, p orbitals on the left are aligned and then the three p orbitals on the right are not aligned with the other orbitals, but they're aligned with each other. Similar to before, we start to create these nodes where electrons can't exist. And that's going to create a little bit of instability there. And then as we keep going up, we're adding more and more areas where electrons cannot exist. So these are becoming more and more unstable. Now, you'll notice that the three bottom molecular orbitals all contain electrons. So those are the bonding molecular orbitals. Those are the most stable. And then the three orbitals on the top are the antibonding molecular orbitals. All right, and then again, we have our highest occupied molecular orbital and our lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. And again, those are our frontier orbitals. That's where all of the chemistry is going to happen. Now, um, looking at this, we have more molecular orbitals than we did for the last molecule. The more molecular orbitals you have, the smaller the energy between the HOMO and the LUMO. So let's say smaller delta E compared to ah, 1, 3 butadiene. I ran out of room there. But because this molecule has a smaller difference in energy between the HOMO and the LUMO, it's going to be a lot easier to, for instance, excite an electron up to the LUMO. So that can create some really cool chemistry. So let's talk about um, other conjugated pi systems and how uh, these energy differences can affect them. All right, so the first one we're going to talk about is lycopene which we saw on the first slide um, in the last lecture. So I mentioned that lycopene is responsible for the red color in tomatoes. And then down below that, I also have another molecule with a conjugated pi system called beta carotene. And we actually got to see this one in our spinach lab. So spinach does contain some beta carotene. And this molecule produces an orange color. And this is actually responsible for the orange color in carrots. So let's just see what kind of happens here. So in lycopene, Again, we have all of these conjugated pi bonds. Let's see, so there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 pi bonds. 
um, so that would be, let's see, 22 pi electrons. And oh my gosh, how many p orbitals would we have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 22, right? Because we'd have two per each. So if that's 22 p orbitals, you can imagine the molecular orbital diagram is just all over the place. It's probably really uh, confusing. But because we would have more molecular orbitals for this molecule, that means that the energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMO is really, really, really small. So this molecule can actually absorb a really small amount of energy to excite an electron. Now, if it excites an electron, it's actually going to absorb energy in the ultraviolet region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So let's say we've got our, our HOMO um, and our LUMO. And let's say we excite an electron up to the uh, LUMO. So that means we've absorbed some energy in the UV spectrum or area of the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, when the electron relaxes back down, it emits a photon. So this might bring you back to um, general chemistry a little bit, uh, specifically the quantum mechanics portion. But remember, a photon is a packet of light. So lycopene is actually going to emit um, a photon that has the same energy as the red region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So that's going to then come out as red light, at least for lycopene. OK, so then let's apply that to beta carotene. So beta carotene, let's see, has also a lot of conjugated pi bonds here kind of all the way across the molecule. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11 pi bonds again. So again, that's going to create a really complex molecular uh, or set of molecular orbitals. And the energy difference between the HOMO and the LUMO again are very, very small. So this is going to absorb light in the same way, but instead of um, emitting red light, this is going to emit orange light. Let's look at um, a absorption spectrum, and this was produced by using UV-Vis spectroscopy. So we were using UV rays and visible light and our molecules were absorbing that uh, either the UV rays or the visible light. And then their electrons were excited and then they relaxed back down and emitted some photons. So again, we have the HOMO and the LUMO and we're exciting electrons up, and then they're relaxing back down and emitting a photon of light. So on this particular spectrum, it looks like uh, we were measuring chlorophyll A, chlorophyll B, and some carotenes. So here, it looks like uh, chlorophyll A is absorbing light in the red region and in the blue region.
And then it's emitting light in kind of this greenish yellow region. Now, uh, if we look at chlorophyll B, chlorophyll B is absorbing light in kind of the orange region and the blue region. And then it's emitting light in this green yellow region. And finally, the carotenes, or the, uh, let's see, carotenoids, they're uh, absorbing light in the blue region. And I think that's it. So then they emit light in, let's see, kind of the orange yellow region. So again, some of this has to do with uh, these conjugated pi systems. So for instance, we know beta carotene emits orange light because it's absorbing blue light. So uh, we're kind of looking at opposite sides of the color wheel in that sense. Okay, so uh, in this lecture, we talked about molecular orbital theory and we applied it to conjugated pi systems. And we saw, for instance, that these conjugated pi systems have an energy difference between their highest occupied orbital and their lowest unoccupied orbital. And that can have a large effect on, for instance, the color that the molecule produces. Um, or later on, we'll see that it can affect reactions between a conjugated pi system and another molecule. So keep the molecular orbitals in your mind because we are going to talk about them later on as well. All right, I will see you in the next lecture.